The executive session of the Wayne Board of Education PWS meeting of October 7, 2021 was convened in the conference room of the Wayne Board of Education, 15 Ellis Drive, Wayne, New Jersey. The statement of compliance setting for a time, date, and location was read in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act and roll call was taken. The meeting was recessed and is now being reconvened. Can I get a mover? Mrs. Putta, Mr. Giordano, please rise for a flag salute and a moment of silence. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Tobeck. Everyone hear me? Okay. So good evening, everyone. At our next meeting, our student representatives will be joining us. A reminder that our next Board of Ed meeting is on October 28th, which is one week later than usual due to the fact that the school board's convention was normally scheduled for the third week of October. Um, a number of committees will be meeting, or did meet this meeting, or this evening, and will be reporting, so I'll limit my comments so I don't duplicate the reports. The COVID situation in our schools has been, for the most part, stable, with no major spikes or outbreaks that threaten our ability to keep our schools open, 63 additional students and staff have tested positive since the first few weeks of school, with 178 people identified as close contacts. The good news is that we have had a reduction in the number of close contacts who had to actually quarantine because some close contacts were vaccinated. Um, in this case, 141 of the close contacts had to quarantine and 37 did not, so that helps. Keep in mind, these are the cases where the schools acted. There are other cases where people are in quarantine for other reasons, including travel and family members testing positive. Governor Murphy's Executive Order 253 requires that all school employees with frequent school contact be vaccinated by October 18th, which is only a few weeks away. At this point, the district has developed a database and has loaded much of the information into a new software package designed for vaccine management. So we're in a good position to meet the requirements of the executive order. I'm pleased to report that our first weekly district newsletter will be going out tomorrow. For our HIV report, I'm reporting the following data related to harassment, intimidation, and bullying incidents in the Wayne Township Public School District. There were two incidents investigated since my last report, and neither case was deemed to meet the criteria of HIV incident. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Toback. Mr. Moffitt, revisions to the agenda, please. Yes, we have a few tonight. If we can go to the emergent section of the agenda. Is under... your mic on? Okay. A little better? Yes. Yep. If we go to the emergent section under human resources, the first one is item T5, which is approval of a revised items. Revised as follows. Number four, ID number 8957, revised to read November 8, 2021 through February 4, 2022, FMLA without pay and with benefits. February 5, 2022 through uh, May 15, 2022, WEA extension without pay and without benefits. Under T5 again, number six, Courtney uh, D-U-I-N-S-A-V-A-S-T-A-N-O change to interim AP to long-term replacement AP. And we'll add to T5, add number 10, which is adding Dawn De Pasquale as uh, Fairview Lakes chaperone for Lafayette School. Moving on to item T6, approval to rescind items, will be add number four, which is rescind Kim, and I'll spell last name, M-A-T-H-I-S-E-N, at Fairview Lakes chaperone for Lafayette School. Under T12, approval of transfer, revise as follows. Under number one, revise Hannah 
uh, and the spelling is S V A D S O N to the correct spelling, which is Hannah S V E N D S E N. And we'll be adding to tonight's agenda under uh, emergent human resources. We'll be adding uh, T13, which is approval of the revised final collective bargaining agreement and salary guides with Local 11 International Brotherhood of Teamsters Dispatchers Unit. And that rec uh, resolution reads as follows. That the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of the superintendent, reapproves the revised final collective bargaining agreement and salary guides with Local 11 International Brotherhood of Teamsters Dispatchers Unit for the period July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2024, which incorporates the agreed upon article Roman numeral XII, which is benefits uh, and authorizes the president of the Wayne Board of Education to execute the new collective negotiation agreement as discussed in the executive session. That concludes tonight's revisions to the agenda. Thank you. This portion of the meeting is open to citizens for comment on agenda items only. Residents are to state their names, addresses, and subject matter. Comments may be limited to three minutes per person. Members of the public are discouraged from speaking negatively about an employee or a student. The board bears no responsibility for comments made by the public. Comments regarding employees or students cannot be legally responded to by the board. Other comments may be responded to tonight or at subsequent meetings under old business. Can I get a mover? Move. Mr. Giordano. <coughs> Mrs. Putup. You need to turn the mic on first of all. Oh. We can't hear you. And I need a timer, so hang on a second. Sorry, are you okay? You want a time for me? Can I take my mask off? You okay? All right. She said, yeah, she's okay. Can I take my mask off? Madam President? Yes, go ahead. You can pull it down to speak and then just put it back up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, Jim Frieswick. Uh, I reside in Wayne. I'm here to speak about items U5 and U6 on the uh, agenda. That's the uh, a policy for school employee vaccination requirements. This policy which you're going to consider uh, <clears throat> is in accordance with executive order number 253 signed by Governor uh, Murphy on August 23rd. And under this policy, the board shall adopt and maintain a policy that requires all covered workers to either provide adequate proof that they have been fully vaccinated or submit to COVID-19 testing at a minimum of one to two times each week. However, under Executive Order 253, Paragraph 7, it provides that nothing in this order shall prevent a covered setting, that's the school district, from instituting a vaccination or testing policy that includes additional or stricter requirements. And your policy uh, follows that provision uh, on page two. It says nothing in this exec nothing in executive order 253 and this policy shall prevent a board of education from revising this policy to include additional or stricter requirements. I would ask this board to impose a stricter requirement on employees of this school district by requiring them to get vaccinated or lose their jobs. Get vaccinated or get fired. That's the policy of Wayne Township with respect to Wayne Township employees. And the opinion of the township attorney is that that policy is lawful. And it's a better policy than Governor Murphy's policy <clears throat> outlined in Order 253. And it's better than the policy being considered by this board. 
Also, with respect to your policy, you provide that if a unvaccinated employee, if, if an employee, if an employee of this district is unvaccinated, he must undergo testing at a minimum of one to two times each week to be determined by the superintendent of schools. But there's no criteria to guide the superintendent in making a decision whether or not an employee has to get tested once a week or twice a week. And, and that's a flaw in this policy because any determination. Thank you, sir, that's your time. Anyone else wishing to speak on agenda items only? Okay, I have a mover by Mrs. Scher to close public portion, seconded by Mr. Bubba, Mr. Moffitt. Okay, we're moving on to committee reports. We'll start down on the other end. Mrs. Kumar, do you have a report? <laughs> okay. Um, sorry about that. Education committee met tonight. Um, board members in attendance uh, were Eileen Albanese, Matt Giordano, and I. Administrators in attendance were Donna Reichman, Paula Clark, and Matt Mignanelli. Um, we discussed uh, our last education committee minutes on September 9th. We reviewed a residency. We looked at, at our dual agreements, which are pretty um, important between PCC and Rockland Community College. And we looked at some of the schedule for our PSE, PSAT testing. And we reviewed new policies and regulations that need to be put into place. That concludes my report. Technology met tonight. Oh, it's on. This one's on. This one's just dead. Yeah, it's on. Oh, wait. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Technology met tonight with Dr. Burchard, myself, and Mrs. Shear. Uh, we discussed. discussed Insurance for Chromebooks, the department's looking at reviewing options for Chromebook in insurance policy. The department's going to investigate alternatives to the current policy and they will come back with us with recommendations. Um, we also talked about the email retention policy. Uh, we are going to develop a policy based on the law of how much email we have to keep. And then we will come back and um, cipher it down from there. We have an update. We have starting to receive technology equipment that we ordered in July that has been um, slow due to shipping and parts. And we're finally starting to see some of it come in. And we are scheduling installations now. And we, the elementary schools completed the New Jersey Strong Assessment, Start Strong Assessment last week. The middle and high schools will begin to take the assessment next week. Um, no major technology issues were reported during the testing, which is always good. And we also talked about they installed a, an outdoor huddle cam at Wayne Valley to tape games for coaches to be able to analyze games from the press box. And they're also going to be 
unveiling soon a high school ticketing system for sports and events in the district. So you would basically pay for the ticket and then show the, the QR code when you get to the school and that's how you're getting in. So, and that concludes my report. The Finance Committee met this evening. Myself and Mrs. Kazan, along with administrators, Mr. Moffitt and Ms. Leidig. Uh, we reviewed the agenda items, check register, financial reports, contracts for special services, transportation agreements, uh, special education tuition contract for, with PCTI, and attached policies. Um, there was no budget transfer review because there were no transfers. Um, we have yet to receive an audit update because our auditors have not gotten back to our uh, business administration office with their findings. Um, and we looked at anticipated revenues coming in from IDEA and ESSER two. Thank you. Thank you for those reports. Any questions from the board for discussion on any of that? Okay. You had a question, Mrs. No. Let's move on to the agenda. Can I get a mover? I'll move. You'll move what? I'll, I'll move the whole agenda, Thank you. Mrs. Kazan, if Thank that's you. what you'd prefer. I'll second. Okay. Moved by Mr. Bubba, seconded by Mrs. Putup, the full agenda. Mr. Moffitt, discussion? Questions? Okay. Everyone's done their homework. Roll call, Mr. Moffitt. Mrs. Kumar? Yes. Mrs. Putup? Yes. Mrs. Shear? Yes. Mrs. Albanese? Yes. Mr. Bubba? Under T, emergent items number five, um, line number seven, no, yes to the rest. Mr. Giordano? Yes. And Mrs. Kazan? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. This portion of the meeting is open to citizens for comment on any topic. Residents are to state their names, addresses, and subject matter. Comments may be limited to three minutes per person. Members of the public are discouraged from speaking negatively about an employee or a student. The board bears no responsibility for comments made by the public. Comments regarding employees or students cannot be legally responded to by the board. Other comments may be responded to tonight or at subsequent meetings under old business. Can I get a mover? Move. Mr. Giordano, Mrs. Putup. God, hello. Tori Esposito, 47 Woodlot Road. Here I am, as some in Washington would like to call me, a domestic terrorist. Dr. Toback, thank you for sending me the guidance on travel. So that's a CDC recommendation and not a mandate. So the same CDC who says cloth masks don't work and to use N95. So why isn't the district supplying those for our students? The state of New Jersey does not follow this. My employer does not follow this guidance. I'm demanding Wayne Township drop this CDC recommendation. Question for everybody. Where will you find these books? Who Are You? A Kid's Guide to Gender Identity, Sparkle Boy, and my favorite, When Kayla Was Kyle. At every Wayne Township Elementary School Library, WTF. You have been up here for months stating that you are not teaching this. This was all found on the Wayne School's resource website when searching by school under library resources. The things that you won't find on that website, any mention of the Bible, Jesus, Muhammad, or Allah. You sat here for months saying that you're not teaching it. So what are these books? If there's a book on CRT, are you saying that you're not teaching that? They just happen to be readily available? How can students read these books and then in the next hour learn about biology? Can I start? Um, 
Can I start? Yes. Jim Frieswick, Wayne, New Jersey. Uh, I attended last night's council meeting, and there was a discussion raised by council member Ritter, who proposed that a sidewalk be installed on Verdan Avenue across from the entrance to Wayne Hills High School so that high school students can cross Verdan to the sidewalk and walk down along the side of Burdan Avenue to the driveway entrance to the Passaic Valley Water Commission's Point View Reservoir, across the driveway and then into the Point View Shopping Center for lunch. Apparently, juniors and seniors are being let out during the day for lunch. And uh, that was the proposal, and Mayor Vergano said he'd look into that by contacting the Passaic Valley Water Commission which owns the property to see if it, it, the township could obtain an easement. And he'd also contact uh, Passaic County, which owns Burdan Avenue, to see whether something could be worked out. Meanwhile, that's not gonna happen for a long time. And some interim measures should be instituted by this board to protect students who are crossing Burdan Avenue at the entrance to Point View Shopping Center which is not, there's no crosswalk there. There's no traffic light there. So it's dangerous. Uh, and I suggest that you bus students from Wayne Hills High School to the Point View Shopping Center. If you're going to release them in the middle of the day for lunch and they're going to that shopping center, I think you should bus them to the shopping center and back again to get back to school in time. You'll, you should also look into hiring a police officer to perhaps cross the students across Burdan Avenue to get to the shopping center safely. I don't know whether that's legal or not because there's no crosswalk there. But there has to be some type of interim measure. Also, Council Member Sasso suggested that perhaps you could hire food trucks to come to the Wayne Hills High School and let the students eat lunch from the food truck so they don't have to walk across Burdan Avenue to get to the Point View Shopping Center. That was another suggestion. But the board should really look into this. It's a safety issue, and it was a, it, it was, it was a big point of discussion at last night's council meeting. And the mayor's looking into it, and the council's looking into it. And I think the Board of Education should look into it also because we're talking about Wayne Hills High School students. When I was a Wayne Hills High School student here, from 66 to 68, I graduated with the first graduating class. We weren't allowed. Thank you, that's your time, Mr. Frieswick. Roger Gunnell's uh can you 22. lean in? I can't hear you, sir. Roger Gunnels, 22 Lally Ave. The biggest thing I just want the board to do and the school system as a whole is decide what you're doing. You can't teach kids the things that are being taught and promote it and, and teach academics at the same time because they just don't agree. Okay, they, don't, they never will agree. They're not going to agree. And you need to decide what you're going to do, and you need to be honest and upfront with us citizens and tell us what you're going to do instead of hiding it. Because you're hiding it. Those books were found in Lafayette School, where my son goes to school. And I'm going to be direct with every single one of you. My son will not be emasculated. And I'm going to tell you now, I have faced terrorists. The people in this room, we're not terrorists. I can guarantee you we're not. We're not terrorists. We're concerned American citizens and constitutionalists that believe in the American rule of law and American exceptionalism. And our kids, our kids should not be ex exposed to this radical Democrat liberalism. Should not be. But you guys, for the, well, most of you, I, I presume, for those of you who are not, thank you. But those of you who are Democrat radicalists. Sir. What? 
save the political to discuss your issue. Thank you. I got three minutes. I'm going to use my three minutes. So, uh, you know what? Ms. Kazan, I don't appreciate the way you're talking to me, so I, I would hope you would give me some respect. And vice versa. Thank you. I didn't this disrespect you. Ma'am, I, I, didn't, I didn't disrespect you. I didn't disrespect you. So the idea of blurring lines between genders is child abuse. It's child abuse. Kayla's not Kyle, and, Kyla, and, and, and Kyle's not Kayla. You're either born with a X or you're born with a Y. And any effort to teach kids otherwise is child abuse. Because here's why. You emasculate little boys. Who's going to don the next police uniform? It ain't going to be Kyle, and it ain't going to be Kaylee or Kyle or whoever. It ain't going to be them. Who's going to don the next military uniform and stand in the face of evil? It's not going to be those kids because they don't understand that evil exists because they've been taught that everything's okay and evil doesn't exist. You talk to this officer standing here and he will give you otherwise. You talk to me and I will tell you the evil that's out there. I've seen it. I've faced it. But the schools today are hell-bent on emasculating our kids and teaching them that it's, it's okay to do drugs. It's, like, it's, like, it's just like diabetes. It's just like, it's like food poisoning or food allergies. It's in that babes training that's going on in schools. Yeah, I figured that out too. So all I'm saying is be honest, be upfront with the citizens, and let's get out of the habit of supporting these, these ideals that damage our children. Oh, Jill Carbone, 15 Colonna Road. Thank you. Good evening. We, as parents and educators, should be doing everything in our power to help make up for the academic and social development our children lost while isolated during the pandemic. The damage done is extensive, and the long-term effects are not yet known. The current curriculum being introduced in our schools is not helping, but instead further confusing our children and distracting them from making up unfinished learning in the subjects that matter most. In 2019, New Jersey fourth and eighth graders performed significantly worse in reading on the National Assessment of Educational Progress than in 2017. Fourth grade students also performed numerically worse in mathematics. This was before COVID. A July, 2020, a July 2021 McKinsey report found that the impact of the pandemic on K-12 student learning was significant leaving students on average five months behind in mathematics and four months behind in reading wow. at the end of last school year. McKinsey also surveyed over 16,000 parents nationwide and found roughly 80% were concerned about their child's mental or social and emotional health since the pandemic began. Over 35% were extremely or very concerned about their children's mental health. With statistics like these, I implore you to explain why we are further adding to the social and emotional illness of children with the current learning objectives in the school curriculum. In Tunis Die, there are eight books in the library dedicated to gender identity targeting kindergarten to third graders. Titles already mentioned, like When Kayla Was Kyle and Who Are You? The Kid's Guide to Gender Identity. In the latter book, children are provided this wheel where they can select statements like, quote, I have a body that made adults guess boy, and I am trans, gender fluid, or gender queer. While I vehemently oppose introducing the concept of gender identity to children as young as five, and making borderline pedophilic books available in the school library funded by my taxpayer dollars, I cannot fault local educators. This is the New Jersey Department of Education who has established a performance expectation that children discuss the range of ways people express their gender and how gender role stereotypes are, are made limit behavior by second grade. By the end of fifth grade, children are expected to describe gender role stereotypes and their potential impact on self and others and differentiate between sexual orientation and gender identity. I believe Every child has a right to be respected and treated kindly everywhere, including public schools. That includes my children. And I also feel strongly that, that I, as their parent, have final say in what is appropriate for my children to learn about gender and sexuality. Now, now more than ever, taxpayer-funded public school curriculum. 
That's your time, ma'am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, good, it works. So good evening, uh, Alan Asarch, 61 Brandon. I'm not here today to talk about SEL or the sex ed curriculum changes. I've made my points on them clear and trust you'll listen to the parents and teachers with legitimate concerns and make sure you do what's right. I'm presenting a different topic this time because it's affected my child and my family. The New York Times says those anti-COVID plastic barriers probably don't help and may make things worse. The Seattle Times says, fortunes spent on plastic shields with no proof they stop COVID. Bloomberg says, plexiglass is everywhere with no proof it keeps COVID at bay. Time says, the coronavirus seems to spare most kids from illness, but its effect on their mental health is deepening. Joseph Allen, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health says, not a single study has shown that the clear plastic barriers actually, ba barriers actually control the virus. Marwa Zatari, a pandemic task force member of the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers says, the plastic shielding has created a false sense of security, especially when we use it in offices or in schools specifically. If you have plexiglass, you're still breathing the same shared air of another person. After a coronavirus breakout at Wellesley High School in Boston last fall, an investigation concluded that the plexiglass around desks seemed to increase the risk of virus transmission. These desk seals and plexiglass are what they call hygiene theater. Time Magazine tells us that this pandemic and draconian rules have caused these kids such mental health problems as loneliness, no essential socializing, learning issues, meltdowns, anger, and stress. And at first I thought it was all hearsay, but I've seen it in my own home, so I know it's true. My child isn't focused on learning behind these shields. She can't learn together in socially distant groups or participate fully without hesitation. These shields are protecting these kids from nothing and doing more harm than good. And with all due respect, Dr. Toback didn't like the hygiene theater show. Before a board meeting in August, the first thing he did when he entered the chambers was remove it. If it's good enough for him to remove, then it's good enough not to have our kids learn behind them. The virus is not gonna go away. No virus goes away. Kids are gonna get cold, strep, the flu, stomach bugs, and, and more. And a member of this board acknowledged that COVID has a mortality rate of only 4.5% on average versus H1N1, West Nile, bird flu, all with a mortality rate of 45%. The member said, quote, this is a picnic compared to that stuff. I don't believe that death shields are mandated. Please throw us parents a bone, have the kids feel some sense of normalcy and take the shields away. If a parent wants their child behind one, their choice and no problem with it, totally fine but I want my child's death shield taken away. I want her and all the kids to have good academic health, good mental health and social health, which is all being taken away under the rules of hygiene theater. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right. Uh, it's just funny I could take this off. Um, I'm in a school and I'm talking. It's pretty funny I could take this off, but I can't do it in my own classroom when I speak. But um, we've heard a lot of uh, crazy things today and some real things. Like some of us want to have food trucks pulled up to schools when we can't even afford a ventilation. So that's pretty, that's pretty ingenious to me. Um, but but uh, I, I look up, I don't see any three feet social distancing like I have to abide to in school up here among the board members that make me have to do that. Uh, we talk about uh, Governor Murphy's executive order. I have it right here. This is his executive order. Uh, from the official New Jersey um, website. And there is times where we don't have to wear a mask. It says when we are engaged in high intensity acti activities, like in physical education, we can remove our masks. We send out emails and send out letters to the teachers telling them, you saying, hey, you need, to, you need to mandate the mask. Why don't you tell them the exceptions as well? The exceptions matter. Are we gonna only start emailing the teachers saying we have these exceptions when there's kids flatlined because they're breathing in carbon dioxide while they're panting because they're playing soccer and can't go outside and take off their mask? Is that when we're gonna wait till? Because that's pretty unacceptable. I was just playing soccer inside the other day because it was rainy and I could not breathe wearing a mask and I have to leave my class if I want to breathe. I have to lose class time if I want to breathe. If I want to breathe. Never thought I would have to say that in the United States. 
States of America. And then, if you are following his executive order, tell the teachers our exceptions. Tell the phys ed teachers the exceptions. It also says, uh, it, when there's no, if, if you're in a highly ventilated building, like Anthony Wayne Middle School, brand new building like I, that I'm in, it says, you, uh, it, it doesn't say anything about the physical distancing um, when you are taking off your mask in gym. So I think you should tell the physical education teachers about that. Then when we go to gym, I'm not gym, when we go to lunch, lunch is uh, pretty, pretty laughable. We have a kid right here in a plastic shield, but I'm next to, um, I'm, I'm a seat away from him talking to my friend with no plastic shield. It's just there for show. We gotta admit it because we don't wanna throw away something we spent money on last year. We, uh, and then the one seat apart, the one seat apart. The seat's this big, that's definitely three feet. Definitely gonna prevent COVID. It's gonna do so much for me. Uh, and it, it's, it's just hilarious, people in favor of this mask mandate in the schools, because you guys can't do anything. It's an executive order, and I understand that. But then we have people come up here, they take off their mask, they forget to wear What happened to your particles you always talk about, that Dr. Fauci talks about? Isn't that going to spread all around this room, infect everyone in this room, and then we'll have to quarantine? I'll be back. Stella Furinelli, Wayne, New Jersey. I'm here tonight to ask you to understand the effects of the curriculum that has on our children. I pray you don't just accept the mandate because of the money. The future of our children is not for sale. One part of the curriculum, in particular, sets education, state of New Jersey, page 33. for eighth graders, has abortion as an option of pregnancy. Abortion is not birth control. There are risks to the mother. I did some research, real easy, Mayo Clinic, State Department of Health, and the risks include emotional, psychological consequences, physical damage from complications to problems that could lead to future childbearing, risks to the mom, and of course, 100% risk to the baby. This is a religious matter for me, but it is also a humane matter. And why promote an option of pregnancy that is harmful to the mom? I don't understand if you guys understand the consequences of this curriculum that's being set to our children today. And I pray that you do understand the harmfulness effects and the choices that you make to the curriculum before you decide on it. There's a reason parents across America are speaking up. And it's time that, it, it's not just time, it's your responsibility not to just to listen, but to hear us and to speak for us. Thank you. Hi, Louisa Wiltshire, 8 Stone Hill Road in Wayne. I'd like to revisit your mandate. Some are inconsistent, and we really need you to fix them, please. First is the plexiglass shield. Have you seen them in person? Have you gone through school, sat in the seats, you know, get a first-hand perspective into the lives, the eyes, the ears of our children? I did, and it was quite traumatic. Let me start off by pointing out that middle school is lovely. Skylar is amazing. That's where my son goes. Their classrooms look normal. No desk shields. High school, middle school, no shields, but elementary schools are all shielded up. Why? I went to run a PTO meeting. I walked in to see arrows all over the floor as like a psych ward or a juvie center. The classrooms looked like they had little jail cells in them. Our kids are masked up, sitting behind cubes that are essentially germ-filled petri dishes. Can I remind you of the science of this virus? It is airborne. It also settles on surfaces, you know, like plexiglass. I sat in a media center and attempted to listen to other parents who sat behind their own cubed up cells. I could barely hear anyone. It was awful and it was only one hour. All I kept thinking of was how do our kids do this for six hours plus? And what about gym? They have to sit in gym 
or do gym in a classroom behind their little jail cells? Come on, guys, enough is enough. They are conditioned to think this setting is a normal setting, and that is not okay. This is overkill of an attempt at extra safety, going above and beyond any mandate. The masks are mandated. Plexiglass is not. We have looked at other towns. I cannot find any other town that has had this radical of a mandate with plexiglass of jail cells across their elementary schools. It's insane. They are a hazard. They are petri dishes for the virus. They further limit appropriate communication and are, are another deficit to learning. I sincerely request that you please have a vote tonight to remove these useless desk shields from our grammar schools. There is no mandate, no benefit, no desire from most parents. We are not in this to get an award from Murphy on who can go above and beyond without mandates. Please make them optional or just simply make them disappear. The second inconsistency that needs major fixing is quarantining. I personally spoke with Donna Reichman and Dr. Toback, where you both told me that a benefit of the masking is that if children are within three feet of each other but wearing a mask, they will not have to quarantine if exposed. I'm hoping this is still true, but please clarify because there are inconsistencies here. I have a friend whose kid wasn't even in contact and he's quarantining. Parents are having to stay home for these inconsistent rules. It's hurting families financially and children emotionally again. Also, when a child quarantines, I was told they have full access to virtual learning, and this is not. That's your time. Thank you. Pamela Masick, I have two questions. The first, why are there no classes or courses on abstinence? Why do we promote sexual promiscuity but not abstinence? So my second question is, how do you tell others you are concerned that the Wayne Board of Ed promotes obscene material in porn without telling them? I'll go first. Here are two identical books, one from the Wayne Public Library Young Adult section and one from the Wayne Hills High School Library. Same book, both made specifically available to our young, impressionable teens. Just picture your 14, 15, or 16-year-old finding this book, curling up in a chair, and delving in. I'll begin. I was 11 or 12 years old, the first time I can remember fantasizing about having a penis. I was lying fully clothed on a hillside under an open sky. I held a folded handful of grass between my legs. Ma'am, are you reading from a book? Oh, absolutely. Okay. The book that's I, in I your library. I don't think that's appropriate. There's young people in the audience. Uh, of course it's appropriate. It's a library book. It's not in the curriculum. It's in the high school library for 14, 15, okay. 16, 17 year olds. You're darn too, and I'm going to exercise you, you my can free speech. You verbalize your complaint without reading the book. No, no, oh no, you ain't shutting me up. Okay, I discovered it at around the same age. Oh my God. Allison Mitchell writes in Fun Home. Okay, if this continues, we will clear the room. We will clear, because I'm chair of this meeting, madam. Uh, okay, officer, please. Ma'am, ma'am, do you have anything to say? Sir, ma'am, ma'am, officer, if, officer, if the board is unable, I could use a little help here. if the board is the unable to conduct to business, we have to take action to either remove individuals or to recess the meeting. Madam President, I move to close. Is there a second? Is there a 
Officer, her time is up and she's disrupting the meeting. Perhaps you don't understand the rules of the Open Public Meetings Act, folks. I'm not going to argue here. But this is a lack of decorum, and the chair has asked her to stop speaking. Okay. We have a mover on the floor to end the meeting. Now, I don't have a second yet. Would you like the meeting to... I second the motion, Madam President. I take that as a threat. Okay, there's a move to close. Is there a second? Mrs. Puttup? Okay, roll call, Mr. Moffitt. May, who, the motion was motion by who? Mr. Bubba, I need the motion in a second, please. I can't I hear you. Close. Over the noise motion in the room. I need, who motion? I motion to close. Mr. Mr. Bubba, Bubba second to end the meeting. Putt Mrs. Puttup seconded the motion. Roll call, please. Mrs. Puttup? And watch people yell all night. Yes. Mrs. Shear? Mrs. Shear? Yes. For what? Close the meeting. Mrs. Shear? No. No. Mrs. Albanese? No, but I would ask people to please settle down so we could continue the meeting with the quorum. But no. That's a no? Recorded as a no? Mr. Bubba? Mr. Yes. Bubba? Board yes. members should not be treated like this and have somebody threaten them right in front of the officers, for Christ's sake. No. Close this meeting. Yes. Recorded as a yes. Mr. Giordano? No, but I would, I would ask everybody to try and maintain some kind of civility here. It's actually starting to sound like a bit of a rabble, and that's actually a bad reflection on the people who want to speak and express themselves. We only had two people talk or three people talk. It's spoiling for everybody else. I want the meeting to go on. My vote is no. Mrs. Kumar? I would like to explain my vote. I am going to vote no on closing the meeting on the condition that we understand the reason why we cannot read things from other people at the meeting. Those are other people's words that you're taking that will be posted on the internet and we don't have the copyrights. We don't have the authority to post those things. So please express your own opinions. That's, that's important. So I'll, I'll record that as a no. Mrs. Kazan? What's the vote count, Mr. Moffat? Two yeses and four noes. Okay, the meeting continues. I'll abstain. Abstain. Motion fails. Okay. Can we have order? Can we respect the police officers in the room who are asking you to calm down? Okay. That would be appreciated because I can close the meeting without a vote. But I won't do it because there are sane people in this room who would like to speak politely. And I will allow them to. So thank you. Next. Uh, Amy Altamar, Oak Lane. And it's kind of ironic that you wanted to pay respect to the police officers because I have sat all summer watching the videos from my home, believing you guys. No critical race theory in our schools. My son brought home a book called All American Boys the other day. I thought it was a football book, right? The guy's arms are up, what looks like lights behind him. So I said, oh, what's it about? He said, I don't know. I said, did you read the book? You know, the back of it. He said, no. So I paged through it. The back kind of sparked my interest. And I sat at my kitchen table. I read 91 pages of the book. Nor is it appropriate for children, eighth graders, seventh graders, sixth graders. It came from Anthony Wayne. It's not appropriate for whites, blacks, police officers, 
and I'm quoting, I don't have the copyright, but I didn't paraphrase it like at home because I thought I'd be able to read it. It's uh, by Brendan Keeley and Jason Reynolds. It was a, a duo author. And what they said was, I want to thank all librarians and educators who support all American boys and who have championed it and opened conversations about police brutality, race, racism, systemic racism, whiteness, and white privilege in your community. You all do the tough frontline work of engaging young people and nurturing young minds and bodies. Minds, bodies, bodies matter because there are too many minds and bodies missing. Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Blank, Michael Brown. This is why I say black lives matter every time I get behind a microphone because young minds and bodies are missing. I can't bring them back, so the question is what, I, what am I going to do to go forward? As a white, heterosexual, cisgender, able-bodied man, when I think about the peace, brotherhood, and nonviolent social... Pam, is social this the jacket you're reading? This is in the, the back of the book, because I got 91 pages in, and I said, am I going to sit here at my table worried about my son being exposed? What if he wants to be a police officer? How, like, what if he wants to, you know, how do you, how do you mold okay, the vulnerable... Okay, I get the gist of the description of the book. Thank you. We're not going to read from books. I'm, I'm giving the synopsis. If she can tell us her opinion about the book, that's fine. My opinion of the book is it is not appropriate for young, vulnerable minds who don't know what they want to do when they grow up, who are in a school with black, white, Asian, whatever you are. What, we, we live in a very broken world, it's very angry, and I feel like books like this are just stoking a fire. How is this not critical race theory when every word in the back of the book that this author surmised hits every single point of critical race theory? I believed you guys all summer. I stood there, I sat on my, de my deck or my couch and I said, no, I believe the representatives of our town and what they want to do for our children. And then I read the book and I... Nicholas, let the first time speakers go before you, please. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Sandy Prasakos and I live in Wayne. I want to first start off by stating some of the outcomes from the June 10, 2021 presentation given by the diversity consultant. Curriculum and instruction committees were created at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Training was provided on identifying seven types of bias found in instructional materials. Committees reviewed books, texts, and novels that were used, uh, especially in English language arts and social studies for various types of bias. So the results of the findings were then published and presented to the district by the diversity consultant in, in this packet. So in putting together a final summary of the diversity, equity, and inclusion goals outcome, it was stated, quote, the work was collaborative in nature and the consultant worked with over 100 staff and stakeholders in completing this audit, end quote. The point is that the district made quite a big deal to find even the slightest form of alleged bias in books that are available and used to teach our children. However, it is unfortunate that the district administrators or whoever was in charge didn't seem to instruct the consultant to look for obscene se sexual content towards minors. There was nothing about explicit content mentioned in her presentation. Maybe that would have cost an extra fee, I, I don't know. With the recent community outrage towards this disgusting and obviously inappropriate content found in the books available in various school building libraries, the only appropriate thing to do now is to conduct yet another audit. I am calling on the board to allow for an investigation of all the material that may be viewed by a student in the library or in their classrooms. This time, the, stu the superintendent himself can collaborate with a different group of 100 people. These 100 people must consist of district police officers trained in identifying pornographic
materials that are illegal to show to minors. Also, I recommend that in the group, there must be lawyers and other community members trained in identifying what constitutes endangering the welfare of a child. And of course, there needs to be parents. Any parent willing to volunteer should not be excluded from this group. The Wayne Township Public School District must stop promoting garbage books that sexually exploit, confuse, and endanger our children. In fact, the district must stop promoting a curriculum that normalizes hateful and inappropriate ideologies. This once great district is on the wrong pathway. Our administrators can sugarcoat this district and feel accomplished by the amount of PowerPoint presentations they put together, but surely all of you sitting up there cannot sugarcoat the fact that you've created a mess in this town, that you are now owing it to our children to fix, please. And by the way, the new mission statement that you all voted on also needs to be rewritten. Thank you. Good evening, um, Brittany Coral, 36 Lawrence Road. Uh, before we go ahead and start implementing draconian measures like mandatory vaccines without room for any exemption, um, let it be known that under the law, the Township of Wayne and anyone who votes to enforce such a mandate can and will be sued when the teachers and staff have adverse reactions and or die, and trust me, they will, and everyone who votes on that will be held liable. It's just something for you guys to ponder. I'm asking if that's something you could live with on your conscience. Um, I'd like to tell you all about a mother named Jessica Berg Wilson. Jessica was a 37-year-old mother of two little girls. She loved being a mom more than anything and wanted to be involved as, involved as possible in your young daughter's lives. She thrived in her role as a class mom for her daughter, Bridget. But because of an executive order put in place by Governor Jay Inslee of Oregon that stated that all school employees needed to be vaccinated with zero exceptions. Jessica op opted to get vaccinated other than miss out on participating in her children's education. She died two days after being vaccinated. The cause of death was vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, blood clots. This woman was vehemently against the COVID vaccine, but she felt she had no choice. She was told get vaccinated or get fired like Mr. Frieswick said. Do you really want to put that same threat to our educators, the people that are teaching our kids? Don't listen to people like Mr. Frieswick. I'm urging you to respect our teachers. <laughs> I'm a nurse. I worked this entire pandemic pregnant. That, that choice is not being given to me. Don't do the same thing to our teachers. Ryan Battershill, 63 Camilla Drive. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, sorry, every time. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, I found some data on COVID, which says that the average mortality age for COVID is 78, which is higher than the actual mortality normally in the United States, which is only 76. In addition to that, the R0 number for Passaic County is now down to 0.8, which is great, which means we are coming out of the Delta wave. At which point will this board now decide to send a letter to Murphy and ask him if now is the time to start removing the mask mandate from the children? The other thing I'll say, I think is, I am shocked and appalled by the books that are being found in our school libraries after there was commitment from this board that these books were not in our school libraries. I will seriously hope that after this, you do do some kind of review across all of these books and immediately remove them. This goes from everything from the inappropriate ones found in Lafayette School all the way up to the high school ones which are pornographic and have been shown to us tonight. Lastly, I spent the last um, weeks since the beginning of school, since I came to the board and I said that I wanted to opt out of all of these things. And President Kazan specifically said that we were able to opt out of virtually everything that is not a graduating requirement at two hours and 14 minutes into the June meeting. 
I went back over, I looked on the website and went to find it because we said we should. That process, which has taken over a month so far, two weeks of not hearing anything, pushing on it again, going through the building as you have recommended during this time, having a very wonderful conversation, I will point out, with Mr. Criley, who is a great principal, um, and we had a great in-depth conversation about different teaching beliefs and so on as well. Um, in there, he committed that none of these books were available. In fact, we had a discussion about what would happen if a book was taken out to show something specifically, and it happened to have different characters, different races, and we both agreed that that would be absolutely fine, as long as it wasn't specifically going in and saying, there are these people, and you should be doing this to these people, because that creates division. That creates the problems that we are seeing here tonight. And he committed that those sorts of things wouldn't happen. And then this book is in Lafayette Library, which is concerning to me for because I need to be able to trust all of you. We need the truth and transparency and honesty. In addition to that, it turns out that the opt-out is not universal for any of this. It is purely and only against a very small fraction. That's your time. Good evening, Jennifer Lee in 40 Terrace Road. Um, I've addressed this board on several occasions, stating my concerns with regard to the way that the Wayne schools interprets and rolls out mandates within our district. Since the last meeting I attended, there have been some developments that I believe that it would be of concern to all parents, as it appears that our school system is in many instances choosing COVID-19 protocol over other equally important safety measures. The following is a list of concerns among district parents for your consideration. As of September, our district is short 12 bus drivers. How many students are now being put on each bus as routes have been consolidated? How are you ensuring social distancing on the buses if there are less buses than before? How is being on a crowded bus okay, but it's not okay for students to sit next to one another at lunch? With regard to lunch, there have been concerning reports from families involving elementary students who are being told to bring towels in to eat on from lack of seating due to distancing protocol. Would children eating on the floor be safe in the event of a school emergency or an evacuation? Why are classrooms not being utilized so children can sit in an actual seat? Apparently, our district administration thought it best to close select elementary school gyms in favor of setting up student desks for contact tracing during lunch. This is, to my knowledge, not required by the state. So the gyms that our children should be learning in and staying healthy in have been closed off, forcing PE into plexiglass crowded classrooms during inclement weather. Winter is fast approaching, members, and I can't see how this is an educationally beneficial solution to that issue. The final concern relating to lunch deals with students in this very high school as they are being allowed to cross Burdan Avenue with no crossing guard to access our local eateries. This has tragedy written all over it, and it's appalling that it's continued on through October. The last point that I'd like to make relates to instructional staffing, and this is a big issue. As of this week, we in schools will require all substitutes to be fully vaccinated without the option to test, or they will be unable to work in our district. What effect is this going to have on our substitute pool numbers? Are we not already short on subs? Are students expected to lose more educational time due to staffing issues now further complicated by your district policy? I realize that adherence to mandates are of utmost importance to this board, so much so that you chose to go above and beyond current guidelines and close school for a half day due to heat instead of simply allowing the kids to pull their masks down if it got hot. But are you comfortable with there not being enough adults in the building to safely monitor children because of your requirements? Per CDC, the vaccine is not perfect protection and breakthrough cases are becoming more and more prevalent from Delta. So why are you making an already strained staffing situation worse? I invite you all to take a step back and look at what you're asking this district and our children to sacrifice in the name of your unwavering devotion to mandates and edicts from our governor. Truly ask yourself, is this for the safety of the kids or is it for your public perception of virtue? Unfortunately, the repercussions of your decisions are impacting a generation of children in this town, and I'm imploring you to please stop taking it lightly. Hi, my name is Heidi, and I'm a resident here in Wayne. Um, Where? I wanted to talk a little bit about transgender people, since those are the folks who seem to be coming under um, under 
criticism and, and uh, challenge here. Um, first of all, in a study that was, has been done of, well, multiple studies of adult Americans, between 0.6 and 1.4% of Americans are transgender. What that means is that there are kids in our schools who are transgender. And in fact, a Cedars-Sinai study showed that the mean age of the transgender women's earliest memory of realizing that they were women, that they were female, was between 4.5 and 6.7 years. And for men, it was 4.7 and 6.2 years. Transgender children, according to studies, behave the way that their gender, that they identify as, behaves in studies from very early ages, and some say as young as three. So for the ch transgender children in our schools, they need to know that they are seen. And the reason is that between 50, well, more than 50% of transgender males and more than 30% of transgender females report attempting suicide. But when schools and parents and loved ones are supportive of children and their gender identities, that number drops dramatically and there is essentially no difference between the depression levels of children, transgender children, who are recognized and supported in their gender identity versus children who are not transgender. And that's why it's critical that our curriculum support these children, not force them, but support them in what they already identify as to encourage their mental health. Thank you. Could you hear me? Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well. Hold on a second, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The last meeting he did. He speak at this meeting. Okay. Continue. Go ahead, Nicholas. Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, I do understand. Uh, you, you could come up here and understand, like, no, if you're a transgender kid or whoever, you shouldn't be, like, bullied and beaten. That's wrong. I completely think that's wrong. But you know, people in this room should also acknowledge that as a Christian, and even people who are Muslim and, and Jewish, it, it, it goes against the book of our religion. Are we only going to acknowledge an ideology? And a you could be, be what you want to be, but that does not have to involve me. Uh, if you're not going to teach every ideology, you shouldn't just teach one. And I, I think every, it's made clear that everybody's accepted. Today I just had a lesson, no place for hate for everybody. I don't think they had to specify for transgender and LGBTQ people. It was pretty clear everybody needs to be treated equally. And I understand that. I understand that. There's no reason there needs to be a special part because that's when you feel singled out, when you start making it a special separated part from everybody. When you start separating from everybody. You should not separate, you should not separate someone from someone else and say they are important. You should say every single human being is important. Because they said, in my No Place for Hate lesson, which I agree with, they said, they told us what they should. They told us everyone should be treated equally, no matter who they are, and that's what we should be teaching in our schools, and that's what we are teaching in our schools. 
We should not be teaching this person should be special and even more special than you because you are already teaching every student in this district. Everyone deserves to be special just as much as the next person. We, we talk about our differences, but we do not single out our differences because that's how we should be teaching it, and that's what we are doing. So this board is doing the right thing when it comes to that and no place for hate. And that's a very good thing, in my opinion. There's no reason we should single it out. And I, I mean, what teachers do cannot be controlled by you guys unless you, someone reports it. If that's the teacher's fault, it's not your fault unless it's your curriculum. So if a teacher does something, they should report it, and then you guys should handle it. It shouldn't be, everything's your fault. I understand that not everything's your fault. But then, when, we're, we're, like, we we're in America, and I look around, tonight was not an example of what America is supposed to be. America's supposed to be where everyone has a voice. I understand the problems we had, but I don't think we should have ever, ever had a vote to close public session. But I also do understand respecting the police officers and what they tell us to do because that's what, how I was brought up. But there's, there should have been no vote to get rid of the public session that we are obligated to as Americans and our First Amendment right. Thank you. Excuse me, Ms. Kazan. Mr. A. Sarge, we have someone who hasn't spoken yet in the back there. Yes, thank you. If we could let him go first, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this will be short. Um, my name is Evan Tagliarini. I live in Packinac Lake. Um, I was a Wayne Valley student. I graduated in, in 2020. In my four years at Wayne Valley, I and the other students were given our own personal Chromebooks. And on these Chromebooks, there were firewalls put in place that would red flag any explicit searches or curse words that we put in. And so I'd like to raise the question, if, Chrome, if the Chromebooks that were given to the students of Wayne Township had their own self-censorship, why are there pornographic books in the libraries? It's very hard to follow those two young men. And uh, thank you for pronouncing my name right. Um, I wasn't prepared to come up a, a second time. And I remember when, when we emailed Ms. Kazan, I wanted to thank you in person for spending the time with me on the phone. And I do appreciate it. And the people here should know that Ms. Kazan will talk with you and let you share. And I'm really appreciative of that, despite everything that's going on. And thank you for keeping the meeting the meeting open. So it's just a question that I just feel compelled to ask, because, and has nothing to do with copyright, has nothing to do with somebody else's words, has nothing to do with anybody's political or, or religious views, and maybe I'm being a dead horse here, and don't, please, don't get riled up, it's not worth it. I think we just want to, and I, and I think when we, when we spoke on, on the phone or by email, you know, it just, it, a lot of this is we just want to know why. And I guess we just wanted to know, expressed not well, why that book was inappropriate for this audience, but not for the kids in our schools who can get it from the library. Again, I'm not making a statement about the book, though I have my, my own opinions about it. And I think all, all we just want is an answer. Why are they here? How'd they get here if they weren't supposed to be here? And how do we get rid of them if they're not supposed to be here? And you know, a lot of this always comes down to choice. You know, where's the parental choice to not have our kids get access to any books that we feel aren't appropriate for them? And this, you know, I want to echo, I think his, his name was Nicholas. We're not trying to single anybody out. And I think I, I told you when, or at a previous board meeting, when I went to school here in the Wayne School System, we weren't, we weren't singling anybody out. I went to school with all religions, all colors, all faiths, and this just, didn't happen, and even though it was years ago, um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it just, we're just begging it now, and at least I am. We really need to figure this out. What's happening isn't right. 
we see it all over the country, we see it on every news station, and it, it breaks my heart. And I was just telling the woman behind me that I don't want to pull my daughter out of the Wayne schools, that's why I moved back. I can't afford it either. <laughs> that's a whole different story. So please, I think we, we just want to know why, and that'll help. Thank you so much for listening to me again. Mike Fatale, Wayne, New Jersey. Uh, first and foremost, Wayne Police Department, you guys do a great job. Good job tonight. You guys didn't get published, so very good. Um, I really had no intention of speaking tonight, but clearly we see a divide here, and I think we need to find common ground and bring everybody together as one. Um, it's sort of disheartening to see how upset our family, you know, families are, parents are, um, Dr. Toback, maybe we could put an ad hoc committee together and just try and get some sort of common ground. I do understand things have been legislated and things are in law right now, but if we could find common ground with a variety of parents um, so we are all on the same page moving forward, I think that could be potentially be very productive for our, our school and our children. Um, as far as Inclusion. I am all about inclusion. I have family members that are part of the LGBTQT community. Um, I don't think our children necessarily see someone as different at such a young age. I think that everybody should be included into these programs. Uh, I think that we need to be mindful of the literature that our children are reading. I just, you know, to you guys, I appreciate all the support, but I just think that we, we all need to come together and just just be one and be in unison moving forward because our, our children are most important and they should come first. And at the end of the day, we need to put our children first and, and keep pushing forward for the best education for them. Thank you. I think the gentleman before me, um, Mike, and the gentleman before him, very calmly expressed what I would have continued if I hadn't been shut down. It is, when I started coming here in the summer, I was very respectful because you all had, had, didn't lose my respect at that point. The parents are angry, they're frustrated. I'm a distraught mother. I didn't know I couldn't read the book. I'd like to know where the policies are that I can't read from a book to show you that it's obscene and pornographic. Who, whomever are the committees, for approving obscene pornographic material like this, it's called gender queer. It's not about being queer. It's not about choices being made. It's about the sexually explicit material on masturbation, what uh, the, the toys, whatever I was gonna show you, because I think if you don't see what's in here, you obviously just approved it without knowing, because I cannot believe that any one of you would not have a shred of decency in you and reject this book. So whoever's on the committee is responsible. And there are two C statutes, criminal statutes. It is illegal under New Jersey state law to possess, view, distribute, share, receive, photograph, or allow a child to engage in child pornography. Some of these pictures depict when the author was a child. So whether it's illustrated or an actual photograph, we'll get some legal counsel and I'll, I, I'm not a law enforcement officer or an attorney, I'm a distraught mother. And none of us want this in our child's library or the public library where it's, it's not even, any child could come up and get this book. And that's my point. And we're angry and we're frustrated because you're not hearing us. Uh, yes, I feel targeted, and we'll see how that plays out. But for this, I'm concerned about the safety of the children. I hope you're all aware of these statutes. I'll let you do your research on your own to find out. I do intend to see if there's obscenity, child endangerment, possession and distrib distribution of pornographic material found in this book and any other. I suggest you do as well. Ryan Battershill, 63 Kimono Drive. I didn't think I'd get up. Um, for me, the opt-out 
uh, that was mentioned beforehand and alluded to as well at the parent conference here. Um, that was a comforting thought of the fact that if things didn't change, that we would be able to do reach to that point, which is why I started that process. Um, finding out that that actually covers a very small portion of all of this is a little disappointing. Um, uh, and I, I would like you to take a look into whether or not we can find a way of being able to extend that. So all of these people who feel like this is not something that they want to be taught to their children have the option of not having it taught to their children. It's not about whether or not we are, I, don't, I haven't heard anything that's targeted any specific group. I've heard something that tries to include all of the groups and treat people like people. That's all we want to be able to do. Not take a 0.5% and make that something that's subject to the 99.5% of the population. Thank you. Hi again. I just want to say thank you for letting the meeting continue. Uh, I also want to say, I wasn't going to come up here again, but I, I want to say that um, I'm really impressed with Mike Fatal and standing up here and saying something that I've never heard anyone on the board say, that we need to listen to all sides and we need to compromise and we really, really need to listen to the people and come together as one. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that I think that there's discrepancies in so many areas. When we look at CRT, there's the side that comes over and says, we want to hear history, we want our history included. There's the other side that says we don't want CRT. We don't, we don't, we're not saying we don't want history. I'm sure there's a lot of missing history. I'm sure there's a lot of, of history on different cultures that should be included. But we don't want the history that's going to teach children how to hate. And that's what CRT is. So I think if we can come together and find out what those missing pieces are, we can really make a nice school town, which is what we all want to have. Uh, I think also when you look at, uh, like I'm looking at you know, all these people that are, that are um, voting now and getting ready for Board of ed edu Education, uh, you know, new seats, old seats, and this and that. And I look at, at people that just close their eyes and don't say anything when the people are speaking. And you know, show us, show us tonight that you care about the people. We are asking you to take away the plexiglasses. We're asking you to take away books that are inappropriate. Um, parents are standing here, they're not saying they're anti-gay or anti-trans or anything like that. Parents are saying we don't want our children to be taught inappropriate, developmentally inappropriate, hypersexualizing material at a young age. There's nothing wrong with that. Who wants their kid to be hypersexualized at five to six years old? None. I have friends who have children that are questioning their sexuality at a very young age. They don't want their children exposed to this because they want them to figure out who they are, what their identity will be on their own. And they want to take care of that in their own families. They don't want the school to do it. So uh, again, <laughs> I just, I would love to see some of the board members that are up for re-election, show us that you care about us. Now, I don't want to see signs. I want to, see, I want to hear from you and hear that you are going to do right for the people and the children because that's where you're going to get the votes, like Mike Vital. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandra Leon, Wayne, New Jersey. I am not a very good speaker, and I just have one question. You want to press charges against us parents for what? we feel about, but who do we get to press charges against for things that shouldn't be taught to our kids? How do we go about getting board members removed for inappropriate education to our ch children? How do we get to move to remove somebody that is teaching our kids or possibly exposing our kids to pornography? If this, if this were to happen in a Catholic school, we would immediately have some them removed. Why, how do we get the people that put these books into our schools removed and press charges against them? I would like to know. How do we do that? Do you have answers? We don't have dialogue here. We answer at the end, ma'am. Thank you.
I might have an answer for what she said because I listened to the news and uh, on State the news. Your name, this, ma'am? What? I, did, I didn't hear your name. What was your name? Oh, my name is Annette Colasurdo, and I live here in Wayne for many years, and I've taught for many more. I spent more time in education, I think, than anybody up here. And I've seen a lot of changes. This is stupid thing. Anyway, I heard this week on the news, and this may help. This is how we can get rid of these people that want to put things on the bookshelves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's Congressman Bishop and Congressman Bob Good, Good and uh, Bishop and Good, good names, and they're introducing a bill to ban CRT completely on the basis that it's a violation of the civil rights of the students, which I believe it is. Uh, having taught in schools for close to 40 years, I've seen a lot, and the diversity is much ado about nothing. I have seen diversity. Kids live with diversity. They don't care about diversity. I was in Hackensack High School in the 60s, up and down the aisles, and I see a kid, and I say, oh, what color mascara you have on today? Oh, Miss C, it's blue. Good, you look good in blue. We just, teachers don't discriminate. They don't care what gender the kid is. If you're a good teacher, you're there to teach the kid and help him. Now, my little granddaughter was having a party, and there were all kids around, and they all wanted to hear the story of when I taught out at South Bend, how I got a paddle and I was allowed to be hit the children. And they all want, well, that's how it was. They were some of the best kids I ever had. Anyway, <laughs> well, they were. And I couldn't stand hearing the kids crying in the hallway. And I'd say to the kid, oh, don't worry, Miss C, it's just, a, okay. I was Mrs. L at the time. But anyway, uh, so the kids wanted to hear the story at my granddaughter's birthday party. Now, these kids were all from Wayne, good schools, wonderful kids, all races, all color, everything. And I said, well, don't forget, kids, that was before integration. That was during the days of, the kids looked at me. What's integration? What's segregation? I said, you don't know? Well, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination, this came in, on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin prohibits discrimination in public and prohibits federally funded programs that promote this. Now, I think all the literature and all the CRT, these are federally funded, and that's against the Civil Rights Act. So if these two people, or the congressmen, come in and make CRT uh, against the kids' civil rights, it won't be in the school. So there is hope that you people don't have to keep fighting. Mark Faber, live in Wayne. Uh, I'd like to start out by apologizing to everyone up on the board and all the members, all the people that are here for losing my temper before. Um, it's very uncharacteristic for me to get that frustrated, but. Uh, I'm sure as many of you could understand, this is a very frustrating time to be a parent. Um, I saw things today in books that were shared with me that just made me so upset that my daughters are going to be going into their school library and seeing men giving men blowjobs or kids giving um, adults blowjobs or fantasizing. And that's the book that she was trying to explain to you that is so frustrating that it's in our school. And the fact that my you know, five-year-old up until my 11-year-old daughters could go in and just check that book out. I mean, they can't go into a grocery store and buy a porno magazine, but they can find that in their school library. Do you know how helpless as a parent that makes you feel? That the people who are supposed to be educating your children are providing materials to your kids that you would never give them in a million years to read? Do you, do you have any idea how that feels as a parent? And your sole job in life is to protect the best interests of your, of your children. That's what a parent is supposed to do. And I've been coming to these meetings and I've been trying to explain 
the facts behind things and make you understand how you're making the parents feel and that helpless feeling that we're starting to get because we believe what you're telling us. But then we go along and we find out that what you've told us isn't the case. And you are putting our children's futures at risk by providing them with materials that we don't agree with. You don't know how a book like that will impact one child versus another. You don't know if they're mature enough to actually process the material that's in that book. Yet you've allowed that to be there. How do you want us to believe you and trust you and put the safety and well-being of our children in your care and not be so upset and hurt when you betray that trust that we have to give to you? And it's not even like we have a choice in the matter. You are the elected officials, but you are betraying the trust that is put in each and every one of you. And that hurts me to the core because I wouldn't trust you people to babysit my kid. <laughs> Yet you guys are now in charge of educating them and you're trying to instill your values on my children. And it needs to stop. But again, I apologize for losing my temper. Hi, Janine, I'm from Wayne. Um, I have two things to say tonight. So one is on the sex ed curriculum that you wanna teach to our children. In one of the categories that's gonna teach, I think it was the second level, which is third through fifth grade, um, it's masturbation. And I know everybody keeps telling me it's not gonna be visual, it's not gonna be this, it's just gonna be a definition. So I wanna read you the definition from the Webster Dictionary. Definition of masturbation. Erotic stimulation, especially of one's own genitals, organs commonly resulting in orgasm and achieved by manual or other bodily contact, a exclusive of sexual intercourse by instrumental manipulation, occasionally by sexual fantasies or other various combinations of these agencies that results in an orgasm. Should we tell this to a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old? Because I don't think so. And one other thing that I want to mention, you keep saying how us parents are spreading misinformation. It's all in the school. Who's spreading misinformation now? Because it's not us. How you doing? Uh, Mike McCabe, uh, Allen Drive, Wayne. Um, I wasn't prepared to speak. I wasn't going to say anything. But after uh, the gentleman that came up here that lost his temper, um, I feel 100% the same way he does. And I could easily have come up here and like threw this podium at you guys. Uh, seriously, that book, any kind of literature that is in the library, that ex like like that graphic i mean that's ridiculous honestly and for for this woman to start reading that and you say that that's inappropriate i i mean that just i mean come on really listen to what you just said um our kids are going to these schools and not only to be educated they're there also hopefully that you guys are protecting them as well uh you're teaching ideologies at a very young age uh, that a kid needs to be able to make their own decisions. Um, they shouldn't be pushed in, in a manner of what you think is appropriate. And uh, I mean, it's just that, that type of stuff really has to go. I mean, you just really have to get that out. So thank you. Tori Esposito again, still not a domestic terrorist unless you talk to the president. So everybody was disgusted by that book, but what if that was a, what if that was a film that those high schoolers had to watch? Would that be appropriate? So how is that book appropriate? 
Keep those books in the guidance counselor office because if my eight-year-old comes home with that, it's going right into the fire pit. That will not get returned to the library. Just charge me all the fees up front. I mean, this, we do not teach that. My daughter today, there was an incident in school. She was only one of two girls that didn't have to go to the principal's office in her class. And I was so proud of her. I'm proud of her every day. But to hear that she didn't participate and didn't get into peer pressure, I feel like me and my wife are raising an amazing daughter. That's what we need to teach. We talk about inclusion and diversity. Listen, this month is Italian American Heritage Month. You guys aren't teaching anything, and that's fine. I don't need you to teach them about their Italian culture. I have my, I have my parents who, who came here as immigrants to teach them. I teach that at my house. If you want to teach about Black History Month in February, that's fine. Okay, I will teach my kids what I want to teach my kids. What I do not want them to see, they will not see. I will censor things on the internet that they do not see. That's all we're talking about. Do not keep that visible to especially young minds. Because if that was a movie, people would be suspended for showing that film in class. So how is this any different? Thank you. At this point, I'm on a roll. I have another question. At this point, if you what have your name again, ma'am, Sandra Leon. I'm sorry. Sandra Leon. Sandra Leon. At this point, you're sitting there teaching this, and how is it that a teacher can sit there, and if there is something going on in high school and in the lower educations, how do I know that these teachers aren't fantasizing about my nine-year-old and seven-year-old who are absolutely adorable? And if this is going on, it's absolutely disgusting. I think you're putting stuff that doesn't need to be. You're putting these teachers in a bad position, and you're putting our, endangering my child. This is absolutely abusive. Hello, uh, my name is Chung Wallace, Sterling Lane. I wasn't gonna speak about the sex ed. I actually wanted to come up about something simpler. Uh, so I'll take care of that first. In my family, we were very inconvenienced by the quarantining. Um, one child tested positive in my son's fourth grade class. And I did follow the chain of command and I did get a call, and I'm very appreciative of that, but there is no rhyme or reason to this, so since we're kind of imploring you for a bunch of things this evening, I thought I would also ask you to revisit the quarantine period. If we could go and maybe visit the negative test after seven days, that would be very appreciated, because I know my family was very inconvenienced. I will speak about the sex ed just very briefly. Um, I happen to have two teenage daughters, and we happen to have very open conversations, and I did go to the forum back in August, and when I got home with all the material, I looked it over very carefully, and I decided I was gonna talk about it with my girls. Um, when I said to them, what do you think about this being taught in your schools? Uh, they, they just kind of shuddered and said, mommy, stop, uh, because they don't want it either. And I thought maybe you should hear that perspective, what our kids think. Even they know this isn't appropriate. So just take that into consideration, and uh, I, what I really want to say is um, I'm very proud of the parents of Wayne. Something that I like to do as a teacher myself is teach my parents how to advocate for their children, and I'm really proud to see the parents of Wayne advocating for theirs. Thank you. Madam President, seeing no one else come to the podium, I ask that the public portion be closed. I move that. Thank you. Second. Moved by Mrs. Putup, seconded by Mr. Bubba. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Shera. I can't hear with that blower on. What, it, where is it? Right below, below me? <laughs> um, roll call, Mr. Moffat. Do I need a roll call for this? No, never mind. Okay. Um, are there any comments from the administration tonight? Well, the meeting's not over if you want to hear our response. We just closed public portion, not the meeting. If you give me a few seconds, I have to get all this organized. It's a lot.
Okay, so um, to get started, I'm going to do my best to try to respond to um, a lot of the comments that were made tonight. Um, so I reserve the right to not respond to some comments because some of them require me to go back and do some research and ask some questions and look at some different situations, okay? Um, the main theme, I think, for the meeting tonight was there was a lot of concern that was expressed about some different books that appear in our school libraries. And of course, the district is very transparent in that all of our library books are listed on our computer system. So, and I know that there's, um, there's a lot of books that across the country are being questioned, right? And uh, so this, what's happening here tonight is also happening in, in other communities. So there's concerns about books that um, in some cases are reach, recent purchases, in some cases that are pur purchases for many, for many years ago that um, up until this point have not been questioned, okay? Um, one of the first books that was questioned was a book called Who Are You? The Kid's Guide to, to Gender Identity, okay? So that was ordered in 2018. So that has been in the district. Um, but there's some things to know about that book. Okay. One, one of the speakers talked about whether books um, sometimes are kept by counselors, kept by the principals in a professional library. They're available to teachers, but they're not available on bookshelves. Okay. So Who Are You was available on the bookshelves of some of our schools. Who Are You is a book that very clearly designates um, responsibilities for how the book should be shared with children, okay? So the first part of the book clearly identifies the parent of the child as the person who should read the book first before you share it with your child, and then it should be shared with the child after the parent understands the book, reads it, and agrees with the content, okay? So these books are books that should be reserved and should have been not on the stacks, not in the bookshelves for the students and readily available. They should have been kept in the professional library. They should have maintained, been maintained by the guidance counselors, but somehow, and I don't know, they wound up on the bookshelves of some of our schools, okay? The book was available at Tunis, it was available for circulation, it was available at Lafayette, it was available at Ryerson, and um, it is also available at Randall, but it is not available as a book to students. It's available, it's part of the professional library. Um, from what I know, the other schools do not have it. So today, because of the specific directions that are in the book, those books have already been pulled, okay? The other thing that is evident is that this sort of thing it, it's something that has to be consistent across the district. You should not, not have one book that's set aside for professional, professional reference in the event that you have a parent that comes forward and asks about maybe some resources for their children. Um, so I guess the other thing that in looking at the issue of this particular book, and, and we'll talk about some other books, but Who Are You is a book that was purchased because ultimately there are situations in the district where there's questions by parents and by children at a young age about gender identity, okay? So I'm gonna um, just let you know that right now, I, I surveyed the guidance counselors at the elementary schools, and there are 16 elementary children in the district where their parents have come forward and requested resources about gender identity or LGBTQ issues for their children. Okay. Um, the other point that I'd like to make is that since the beginning of the HIV requirement, so we report these HIV cases at every board meeting, usually one, two, maybe three cases, um, all said and done, we have one, since 2013, we've had 108 cases of, um, 108 HIV cases that are centered on gender or sexual orientation out of the 779 total HIV cases. So about 14, 15% of all the HIV cases in the district have to do with gender identity or they have to do with sexual orientation. So that's just something for the audience to consider, all right? That is something to think about. Um, 
one of, one of the speakers folk focused on the idea that everyone should be treated equally. And um, the administration agrees with that. The goal is to have books where all children can see themselves. And so they can feel included and to help realize that not everyone is the same. So there are students that read books where they feel, this book has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with what I think. So we do want to have books for all of our children. So they do feel included regardless of what they believe. Um, but we also understand the point of view of parents, where sometimes you're saying to yourself, well, some of these materials may not be things that I would like my child to read, or they may be of concern to me. There's also cases of children that have feelings, but they're not sharing them with their parents, right? Those kinds of things happen as well. So those books are out there. Um, the other thing we did is the order where Who Are You was included in 2018. That included about 57 total books, of which some of them were versions of Who Are You, some were other books. So that entire order from 2018 did not undergo the regular review process that the district does follow, particularly in the event of questions about controversial material. So all those books were pulled today from the library shelves for further review before they wind back up on a shelf. So we would follow the district procedure to make sure that that happens. Um, some of the other books I'm not necessarily familiar with, and um, so we would have to look further into those books, but a reminder that the district does have in any time that you find objectionable material, you find that there's a book that you don't agree with. Um, that is something that you, th there's book challenges that have been happening in this district and in every district for a very long time. So it does appear that there's a number of books and a number of parents have challenged books just as of late, including Who Are You and some of the other books that were mentioned tonight. So those challenges have already um, taken place. Um, so there's a question, there's, there's other questions about um, subs. So I just wanted to talk about that because of course, this year we've been very fortunate and school has rolled along smoothly. We've been okay with staffing. I've, I've spoken to the public about issues with bus drivers. And I've spoken a, a little bit about um, some shortages with custodians. But tonight there was a question about the vaccination requirement that we have for subs. So we pay among the highest school districts in the northern part of New Jersey for substitutes. We do have a very strong pool of substitutes. So we do not believe that requiring substitutes to be vaccinated because you have to understand how complicated it is when um, you start a day and you have to determine who's vaccinated, who's not vaccinated, did they meet the requirement? When did, when did they go for the vaccine? Very difficult to do before the start of a school day. So that's why that requirement is there. Um, then the other thing is there's a lot of questions about um, you know, some, some of the shields, I guess. So that was another topic that came up tonight. It is correct. The parent that spoke about the shields was absolutely 100% correct. They are not required. In many places, we do not have them up. And um, in some cases, in some cases, feel, teachers feel comfortable. They have the shields up in their classroom. In some cases, in the elementary classrooms, they are, um, you know, the, the, the teachers feel a little, a little better about having them. In other cases, not. But the fact is, if, if a teacher would like to take down the shields in their classroom, they are certainly able to do that. And that's something that, that's fine, okay? Um, the other thing, I guess there's, ooh. Okay, so, excuse, let, me, let me finish, I'll come back. Okay, what were you saying? not now. Okay, so there was one school, this, this is um, a situation where there's really, there was one school where there was a situation. Now remember last spring, last spring we had a very brief snack period. We did not have lunch, right? We didn't have a lunch period. Now we have a lunch period. And so last year, throughout the year, there were situations where students were spread out outdoors, things like that. And so they were allowed to eat on towels. Um, this year we have full-fledged lunch. We were short a few tables at Pines Lake Elementary School. We ordered tables, we have tables. There are tables for everyone. And TD is still waiting for just a few tables. I think they need four or six tables, but something like that, okay? So there's a handful of tables that they need. Um, what's that? Okay, yep. So another question had to do with the Burdan Avenue um, situation where students, high school students from this school are able to walk over and, and buy lunch at the shopping center, okay? So that has been an option that's been available at this school for a very, very long time. This is not new, okay? Seniors 
that attend Wayne Hills and Wayne Valley have been able to go out and get lunch and walk over to the shopping center for I don't know, long, long before I was here, okay? So I've been here, this is my eighth year. Um, so that's not new. The crossing area down by Brittany Chase was something that's been there for some time. That is, that is the correct crossing area. Um, there is currently, there is no other crossing area right now, so you do have to walk down to Brittany Chase. We have been in contact with the police department. We have talked about some different things. Um, in the end, it is correct. There are, there, it is a county road, and so the county would have to do something to add, um, add a sidewalk. The thing that is different this year is that juniors are allowed to go out to lunch. And the reason they're allowed to go out to lunch is because of the pandemic. So in other words, to avoid crowding here inside Wayne Hills High School, we spread students out as best we can. But the fact is, we do have a unit lunch, and we do the best we can to allow the students to be able to go outside. So we'll continue to work with the police department. We'll continue to seek out if there is a, if the, the township is willing to support an additional crossing guard. Um, these are all things that are fine with us. The, the issue is because of the curve in the road. I mean, I know um, I checked out this, the history a little bit. The curve in the road would not be a place where a crosswalk would ever be placed. It would never be placed in a curve because you can't see around the corner. In other words, drivers coming from the other direction wouldn't be able to see, nor would drivers coming from Brittany Chase in that light be able to see when they're going around the corner. So in no case would there be a crosswalk that would be placed on that curve. At least, I mean, I don't believe so. I think that would be very unlikely because I know a little bit about the whole traffic thing. But um, that's another topic. What else do we have? Okay. So we have these, um, for anyone asking about the quarantine period, I mean, we, we've distributed this earlier, but this is the guidance we follow. There is a rhyme or reason that based on this table. This is, based, this is what we use. What and she um, was what is it? I think she was asking about, I, I think there were, she didn't have accurate information. Okay. It was about travel. All right. Just the so whoever, whoever was asking about the, the quarantine, please come up, come up afterwards and we can, we can go through the table with you if, you if you'd like to talk about it. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. You had, um, you had a question, ma'am? If, if, correct, they're not required, okay? All right. Now, with regard to questions about other books, okay? So, um, it is true that, like I said, there might be books out there that are, um, you know, potentially books that you might disagree with. I ask also that you keep in mind that there are many different students that attend our schools. And there's also many students who have books or are seeking books. So these are not books that remain unread. Um, keep that in mind. And then if there are books, okay, like I said, there is, there is a process for that. And we will, certainly look at, we will certainly look at our list of books tomorrow, starting at the elementary level, just to um, double check our orders and to evaluate the books that are on the shelves. We do have a meeting with our, our library and media specialist scheduled for tomorrow to go through all that. And um, otherwise we would follow the Board of Ed policy regarding all of our books. I think we answered most of the questions. Okay. Anything else? Are you finished, Dr. Toback? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's it. I think we've covered everything. Thank you. Board members, Mrs. Scher. Um, so I have a few things I need to say. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna talk to Louisa for a minute, like it's just us in the room, because um, I appreciate you coming to the meetings what I don't appreciate is everybody who gets up here and screams at us about everything we're doing or not doing, for lack thereof. Um, I'm not up here to do a campaign speech because this is an inappropriate place to be campaigning for anybody. What I will tell you is that you can attest yourself, along with most of the people in this room, that I have, if I have done anything for you, is I have been responsive. And I take offense to being told that board members are not. There is not, I would say I might have missed 10 emails in the five years that I have been here. And that is for reasons I could not control, 
including my mother passing, and still got emails yelling at me for missing meetings because my mother passed away. So that's what happens when you're sitting on this side of the fence, and I just want you to be aware of that, okay? Um, when it came down to you were outside protesting at one point, I made sure every single time I came down, I introduced myself, and I listened to what you had to say. And I fought every single time to get our kids back in school. What people are not understanding that I'm trying to make clear is as a board member, and I, I agree with Mr. Fatal 100%, that is what I've always tried to do, is bring everybody together. It's not that easy. And, and you might see that in a couple months. It's something that we still try and do, whether you want to believe it or not. So every time I'm here, along with Ms. Kumar, I see, we're taking notes. I got a whole list right now for Dr. Toback and Ms. Reichman. However, we don't handle everything publicly because that's not appropriate. It's appropriate for you to come and speak publicly. There's nothing wrong with that. But for us, when we hear a concern from a parent, what do we do? We take that concern and we pass it on and we ask questions. So for example, one of the books that everybody's here yelling about, I already spoke to Dr. Tobeck yesterday about it because someone did it the right way. They emailed me, they asked me about it, I said, I'm not sure. I'm going to find out for you. I found out the answer. I gave it to them. And then Dr. Toback told me that he would be discussing it today at the meeting. So I felt it's going to be discussed. I don't need to bring it up. But I just, I, I just want you to all be aware. It's not that any of us are sitting here not doing anything. I, it's not like we're going on paid vacations from the district or something. We're, we're here. We're fighting for the kids. That is, I could speak for myself, that is why I'm here. I'm fighting for the kids to be in school, to be learning what they need to learn. Not everything happens immediately. I know that many of you are very upset about the, the sex ed mandates from the state. However, you're coming up and you're screaming, you board members aren't listening, you're not doing it. Our curriculum in Wayne for the sex ed has not been written yet. When it is written, then it will be presented to us, and that at that point, before it's presented to you, at that point, we all get a chance to look at it and say, okay, this is great, or no, I still see a problem with it, please look into it more. So we're fighting right now over something that hasn't happened yet. So you have to give us that opportunity I have already said to Dr. Toback and Ms. Rush, I would like to see it when it is completed, before it is presented to the children, because I have concerns myself. They could be different than yours, they might be the same. I have my own concerns. Please, I'm asking you one more time. If you follow the chain of commands, your kid comes home with a book that you don't want your kid reading, for you to take that book and give it, and another parent, not even the person who took whose kid took the book out. Another parent decided to throw that book up on Facebook and rip us all apart for having this book. I have so many problems with that. One, that's not the chain of command at all. You email the librarian, the principal, the superintendent. There's, that's what you do. Or, or even a board member. That's, yes, you're shaking your head. That's how it works, I'm telling you how the system works. That this book that you came and you're screaming, you're reading out loud. I've never seen the book. Because I could tell you as a board member, I don't know every book that's in my library. And you could shake your head, that's right, I admitted it. You know what? I don't run the schools. That is not, that is not, I'm not pointing at you. That is, I am not, no, this is not a back and forth. That's not how it works. Someone got up here with a book and read it out loud and was started screaming about it and got very unruly. That's not how it works. I'm not talking to you. It's not a back and forth. That's not how it works. You had the last almost two hours to speak. Now it's my turn to speak. And I'm telling you, as you can all shake your, I, listen, 
Tori Esposito, how many times have we spoken? I respond to you. I look into it. I get you answers. That's the role of a board member, not to know what every book is in our library, because we don't, we look, oversee the schools. We don't run the schools. And if you'd like to research that, you could go on New Jersey school boards and you could see exactly how that works. But as soon as you bring a complaint, I promise you that I look into it and I always get back to you with an answer. That's the best I could tell you. But us coming up here and getting threatened and screamed at, that's not gonna bring everybody together. So I will work to answer your emails, to answer your concerns, call me. I'll give you my cell phone, I don't care. Luis has my cell phone, Edie has my cell phone. I don't care, I'll talk to you. But please, approach it that way because it's very hard to be up here every time at, and be screamed at and, and not be hurt. It's, it's, it's difficult. And we are all working for the children. That's it. That's why everybody's in this room right now. For the betterment of the children. I am a parent. I am a taxpayer. I am a board member. I still, more than any of you, I care about my children. That's why I do this. So please, you have my email, it's S -Sheer at Wayne Schools. If you have a concern, email me and I promise you I will get back to you as soon as I can with an answer. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Giordano. Thank you. I'm not sure I can hear it, there we go, it's better. Um, first, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. A couple of months ago, I asked you all to keep coming I ask you all to keep questioning. I ask you all to keep, keep, uh, keep us on our toes. Mm. And besides the emotions that ran at the meeting today, you did keep us on our toes, and I appreciate that. Not just the book, and the book is a huge part, but the Burdan Avenue incident, the lack of bus drivers, the plexiglass. These are all things we can sit down and really dig into here. The person who came up and said about violating the civil rights, you know, reading the Civil Rights Act, she's not too far off on that one. And I hope those congressmen go ahead and challenge what the state government has handed us and made us work on here. The only thing I will go out publicly is saying, the only person I'll say to is, and I don't think you share, Mr. Frieswick, I've gotten my inoculations. I'm good with my inoculations. Making it stricter, no, I'm not for that. That's, that's ridiculous. We have a position in place for testing if they don't decide not to do it. No, I'm not, I'm not having this. Uh, stricter, really? Uh, this is not strict enough? The inoculations aren't strict enough here? We're all doing our best here, and we're all trying to come together. And I asked this several months ago, and I, one of the things I said was when we had one group on one side of the, uh, one side of the municipal court building and another side and the other side of the municipal court building, I said, you guys aren't really that far apart. One side is making sure that they are heard. The other side makes sure they want to be respected. If you really boil it down to that, being heard and being respected aren't really hard things to do for civilized people to do. So I'm asking you to keep coming to these meetings. I want you to keep coming after November. When all of this has settled, whether I'm still here on this board or not in January does not matter. I want you to keep coming because you are an essential part of the democratic process. You come up here, you bring points to us, we examine them, and if we deem it appropriate, we correct it. The process has to work, uh, excuse me, has to work that way. I know many of you are angry and many of you are upset, as I said before. When it comes to being parents, sometimes logic goes out the window a little bit here, and it's supposed to be the case here. But all I ask of you is when you come up here, is to come up here and try to treat us with a little bit more courtesy and dignity than what's going in your heart at that time, because you're angry and you're annoyed. But we're here to listen to you. And we'll continue to be here. Please keep coming to these meetings. Keep talking to us. Keep this going here. This is how the process works. As Stacy said, you go talk to a board member, board member talks to the superintendent, you can go to a, a principal. If things don't get done and they don't follow the process, then you can come up here and you let us know and we'll make sure the process gets done. I respect everything that was said here today. I would expect everything that was said at the last six meetings, whether it's masks, CRT, vaccinations, shielding, 
anything you've been talking about here. It's all important stuff. You all get a voice here. And I want you to keep going. Even after all the politics is over and the board elections are settled here, you need to keep going. This is how this works. This is why Wayne is a fantastic educational system. This is why both of our high schools are nationally recognized places of academic and civil excellence. Thank you all. Have a good night. Mrs. Albanese. Um, I'm going to keep my comments brief. Um, today, the board had an education committee meeting. Um, Dr. Tobeck and, Ms. and Mrs. Reichman both alluded to that. Uh, one of the major topics of that committee meeting was concerns from parents about certain books in the library. Um, they've committed already to do a full review of books in the library, teacher classrooms, um, to look at things that you've raised, do a, do a review, do an audit, to see what's in the library, what's been there maybe a very long time that should no longer be there. Um, but I want you to know you were heard, um, and you were heard before tonight, because Mrs. Reichman said she has heard from parents who have reached up through the chain of command, who did give her topics that, she, that needed to be looked at. Dr. Toback, very receptive. There's a meeting tomorrow with the media specialist to begin that process. So you are being heard. Your concerns are heard, because you are the children's parents. Um, so let's let that process take place. You've raised the issue. Let's let the administration review and do their audit, and then they'll get back to us, and, and we'll, get, we'll get fine things from that review. So again, I, I don't want to reiterate what everyone else said, but you are being heard, and your concerns are being recognized. Have a nice evening. When I retired from Wayne Public Schools, I was a media specialist. I was a media specialist on the elementary level. In the almost 20 years that I worked as a media specialist, a parent, a family could always challenge a book in the library. There is a process for that. Our elementary libraries run like 10 to 12,000 volumes, 10 to 12,000 books. The high school libraries are around 20,000 or so. I got to very much pick and choose the books that came into my media center. On the high school level, you have a lot more children in the building, you have a much bigger library, there's still only one media specialist. Often the large book companies like Follett sell books in packages. If a librarian feels that their collection needs to be filled in as far as sex education or gender identity books, they order a package. If they, they, you can order a package for boys' sports. You can order a package for family life. And sometimes you'll get a package of books, and if you're ordering hundreds of books at a time, the librarian doesn't necessarily have an opportunity at the high school level to actually read every single book. We go, we have rating sources that we use, and that's what happens. Sometimes a book will be put on the shelf that may be, in your eyes, inappropriate for your child. And that's why you're able to challenge a book in Wayne Public Schools. It's a very open system. So please take advantage of it if you have a problem with something your child brings home. I think it's wonderful that so many parents are aware of the books their children bring home from their libraries because it's like television, movies, the use of their personal devices. Parents have to be vigilant. Children in this day and age are exposed to everything. Thank you. Anyone else? I was considering saying quite a bit, but now I have to leave this meeting and drive to the Wayne PD and press charges against you, Mr. Faber. 
for threatening me. Move to close. Second. Officer, I'd like an escort to my car. <laughs>